Dan? Yes, we will have the third session about Sudan. Uh, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Fatima bint Abdullah to come to the podium. Uh, also the speaker, Dr. Ali Abu Saqouq, uh, please. And uh, Dr. Asadiq al Faqih and Dr. Muhammad Mahjoub. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Atta al Batani, uh, his wife uh, got sick two days before the conference, so he had to cancel his coming to Istanbul. And instead, we will have uh, Dr. Uh, Ali Abu Zakur. Um, Delivering his paper. Yes. Dr. Fatima bint Abdullah will be moderating the session. Uh, she is an associated professor at our university, Sabahuddin Zaim University. She is also associated with the Center for Islam and the Global Affairs, SIGA. Uh, she received her, her PhD in Islamic Studies and Civilization from ISTAC, uh, you know, uh, from Malaysia. She published uh, several books uh, on Islamic thought and civilization, uh, as well as article. Uh, the floor is, if, uh, is yours, Dr. Fatima. Dr. Fatima, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A very good morning to all of you. Welcome to the third international conference of the Muslim Ummah. In this session, speak, the speakers will speak about the quest uh, of democracy, uh, the quest for democracy, examining civil uh, military relationship um, uh, in Muslim uh, societies, the case of Sudan. Um, without further delay, I would like to introduce uh, the three speakers for this session. Uh, I will first start with the first speaker, it should be uh, uh, Professor Atta, Atta Al-Bathani, uh, but then uh, he has emergency, so someone who's kind enough uh, to help uh, us to deliver his speech, inshallah. So let me introduce the first speaker is Mr. Ali Abu Zarkouk. He's not Sudanese, but he's very friendly to the Sudanese, I guess. <laughs> anyway, the Sudan and the, and the Libyan and the Moroccan, they are like cousin. Uh, so um, uh, he is a member of Libyan House of Parliament in, in uh, 2019. Uh, he has he become Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation in Tripoli, Libya in, for one year, 2015 and 2016. He was the Executive Director of the American Muslim Council. He is as Director of Washington Office as, uh, of the Center for, uh, for the Study of Islam and Democracy in uh, 20, uh, 2004 until uh, 2009. He got his BA in journalism uh, from University of Cairo in 1968. Uh, he got his master degree, master of, master of art in communication from Stanford University uh, in 1971, and Islamic studies in University of Michigan in 1989. At, and at the moment, he is doing his PhD. Um, second speaker. Um, uh, he's Sudanese, um, Dr. Muhammad Mahjoub Harun. He is an assistant professor in social political psychology. It's a very in interesting field to study, and is currently working at Re Peace Research Institute. Uh, he directed uh, research um, Peace Research Institute. Uh, from 19, uh, from 2010 to 2017, Dr. Harun obtained his PhD in psychology from London, uh, from London School of Economic and Political Science in 1970, uh, 1997. Uh, he published in in London, UK, the English Monthly um, um, uh, Journalist. Um, uh, of, of Islam in the West. Yeah, uh, Dr. Harun served as both as journalist and, and publisher, and he published um, um, a lot of uh, uh, publication in, in different, different languages. 
and uh, he as a director of um, of uh, uh, peace research um, institute uh, and he's uh, founded and served as chief editor in the bilingual journals in arabic and english and dr harun has also been active in sudan politics and public spheres and he contribute to public debates and engage in structures and activities aimed at supporting the current state of transition to democracy. Uh, Dr. Harun has also published in, um, in, in uh, papers in, in, in, in different languages, participated in uh, conferences in Europe, Asia, and all over the world. And he is pre uh, frequently commentator in Arabic and English radios and TV channel on politics and public uh, um, public uh, policy issues and uh, Islamic affairs. Okay, thank you. And the third speaker for today is uh, Dr. Asadik Al Fakir. As a former ambassador to of Sudan to Ethiopia, and also uh, to Jordan. And uh, he's also, um, uh, sec he was also the former Secretary General of the Arab Thought Forum in Amman, Jordan. He assumed many leadership positions in political, demo uh, diplomatic, media, academic research, and advisory, uh, adv advisory tasks in many places, uh, including Khartoum, um, uh, Washington, London, and uh, Istanbul. Um, uh, Amman and Addis Ababa. He, had, he was uh, long, also a long uh, time media advisor at the office of president, uh, the council of ministers, the Sudanese embassies in Washington and London. He worked at the Center for Research in History, Culture, Islamic Art uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, and as political expert in Ministry of Foreign Affairs in uh, Doha, Qatar. He lectured and taught at several universities and higher academic institutions and conducted training uh, and capacity building on, med on, on media to professionals in Sudan, Yemen, and Britain. Yeah, Dr. al is also a writer, commentator, and political analyst. He published a lot and in articles in fair uh, referee journals. And um, he uh, also specialized in political communication, international relations, and diplomacy. He studied philosophy, history, anthropology, sociology, media, political science, and economic uh, of the development at Enosis in Sudan, Egypt, Europe, and the US. He holds his PhD in political communication and diplomacy, a master of, an, uh, of American media philosophy, and several specialized diplomas in different disciplines. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker uh, to deliver uh, uh, his uh, speech, um, Dr. Ali uh, Zadruk Marzuk. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Wish you uh, a beautiful third day of our conference. Uh, it happened that uh, Dr. Al-Aryan, uh, our friend, said that uh, we have a paper. The author was not able to come. Would you please be kind since you are here to deliver it? I told him, I'll, I'll see about it. And I found out because I, I do uh, have a good experience with Sudanese culture and Sudan itself that uh, I said I will uh, participate. So if there is any uh, misrepresentations from my side, it's not the authors, it's my uh, shortcomings. Let me start with the paper. It is about civil-military relations in the Sudan, local factors, and role, and role of regional and international powers. Uh, the, he has a very small summary, a short summary. I'll give it to you first, because it, we may not have the time to read all of it. I tried to shorten the papers because of the time limits. The summary said uh, that since independence in mid-50s, Sudanese civilian and military rulers have faced uh, arduous mission of nation building, i.e. holding together different nationalities and other ethnic groups in one United States. Yet, in 2011, cessation of South Sudan 
came as a logical consequence of a faulty one-sided tunnel vision approach to the nation building in a context of diversity. A number of factors contributed to Sudan's tragic story of a failed nation building, major of which are militaristic approach, failed economic development, and most recently, Islamist jihadist approach to nation building from 1989 to 2019. That's the area of the Inqad government. We argue that exclusive militarized and Islamist approach to nation building shared the responsibility for systematic weakening of local factors and strengthening regional and international powers, leaving the country embroiled in protracted conflicts, state failure, and more alarming exposure to external protective, protective interests and pressures. This is a summary of uh, the whole paper. Now I'll try to go through some of the uh, uh, you know, introduction and other uh, parts of the paper. In the introduction, he said, Sudanese civilian and military rulers have faced uh, the mission of nation building, holding together different nationalities and ethnic groups in one United State. This mission, however, has been punctuated with a violent conflict weak civilian governments, military takeovers, people uprisings, democratic elections, failed transitions, and back to military rule in what many describe it as the Sudan syndrome, i.e. systematic failure to manage a historic transition, as well as being subjected to interaction with and pressures from interplay of local, regional, and international factors. In what follows, we will deal with these factors beginning with the local factors. The local factors, first, persistent colonial legacy. To cut the cost of administration and minimize the risk of outbreak of rebellion, the British opted for recruiting a purely Sudanese army to replace the largely Egyptian army, consequently, the Sudan Defense Force, SDF, was established in 1925. Following independence, the SDF became the Sudan Armed Forces, SAF, and vowed to stay away from politics. Bechtold said, considered the army as one of the modernizing elements of Sudan. Ethnic prejudices and affiliations are seen by many to have shaped the internal organizational structure of the Sudanese uh, armed forces, resulting in a differentiated hierarchy with top and upper middle ranks occupied by officers from the northern and central regions and soldiers from other regions. Whether this is perception or reality, it seems it had fed into perception of many and in the course of time fueled discontent of peripheral regions in South, West, and East Sudan, and eventually led to rebellion. Marginalization of peripheral regions. Successful governments in post-independence period are accused of centralization of power and manipulation of administrative structures and uh, to undermine the control of local people and authorities over resources. For sizable portions of population, identity and ideology, particularly Arab nationalism and political Islam, have been used to mobilize support to compensate for the governance and development failings of state policies. Elite, elites have mastered the divide and rule tactics inherited from the colonial era through their territorial organization in the modern Sudanese state. The result has been underdevelopment, exclusion, and violent conflict. Rebel movements. On the eve of independence in January 1956, southern battalions mutinied and took up arms against the newly formed national government. Though armed rebellion was confined to the south, 
In other peripheral regions, calls by educated elites for equal status and fair treatment by central government began peacefully as early as 1950s, but then gradually resorted to violent means. With passage of time, 1955 to 1972, and 1983 to 2005, elements of the Bija in the East, the Four in the Darfur, the Nuba in Kordofan, among many others, have been drawn into armed conflict with the Sudanese government or government-backed militia. Sudan's complex armed conflict has been characterized as a civil war of interlocking civil wars. Equally, it causes, its causes are interwoven, economic, resource-based, ethnic, cultural, religious, and international dimensions all play a role, some being more important in, other, in some parts of the country and then others. All are underpinned politically by the state's crisis of legitimacy and its ability as a vehicle for economic exploitation, which, derives, which drives political elites to compete to control its institutions. Peace agreements signed with rebel movements did not last. And through time, rebel movements grew in strength, involving the army in a war of attrition. In 1980s, the National Army had been fighting at more than one, one front in southern Sudan, Blue Nile, and Nuba Mountains. And at the turn of millennium, therefore joined the violent conflict, and so was East Sudan. Arab nationalism, Nasserites, communists, and Baptists. Give me time, huh? Egypt, under the regime of uh, July the 23rd, negotiated with Britain the self-rule agreement of 1953 for Sudan. And since then, Egyptian leaders viewed Sudan as a close ally. In particular, Nasserites, Baptists, and communist ideological currents have been active in recruitment, in recruiting army officers. During the 60s, the army, inspired by the Egyptian model during Nasser's reign, began to interact with society outside the military barracks, leaning towards leftist and nationalist ideologies. The so-called free officers, a group formed by young and radical officers, supported anti-government protests that led to the fall of Abboud's military regime in October 1964. A period of parliamentary governments followed, but political squabbles and infighting led to yet another military takeover, this time by radical army officers led by Colonel Jafar Numeri in May 1969. In July 1971, a group of Brook communist army officers carried out uh, a coup and declared their intention to reverse. Ooh. The paper is too long. <laughs> okay, but I, I will. Uh, I will finish. I'll try to use. Uh, uh, it's. I mean, maybe you should, we should have distributed the paper itself. Huh? After the abortive coup, President Numeri emerged victorious, signed a peace deal with the Southern rebels in 1972, and moved to reconcile with. Uh, centrist forces. Numeri was eventually overthrown by a broad-based civil protest movement uh, in April 1985. Relationship between the group of officers and the democratically elected government by Sadiq al-Mahdi, leader of the Ummah party, was tense and eventually led to the army serving the prime minister with an ultimatum that paved the way for the Islamist coup or for the Inqad coup in, nine, in June 1989. Uh, here, he spoke about the regional Islamic links in both 18, 1989, and then uh, spoke about the civilizational in disguise. Colo civi, uh, he called it this way, civilization in disguise, the military doctrine. Although regime change in June 1989 was staged as a military takeover, yet it was masterminded 
by civilian control represented by the leadership of the National Islamic Front. Military officers were acting in accordance with politics designed by civilians. The Islamist military coup was designed, planned, and executed by forces outside the country. A change in military doctrine followed. With these changes, the Sudanese army now is in charge not of defending territorially defined nation, but the Islamic State, defending the Islamic region, regime, uh, rather than attending to rules and bureaucratic ethos seen as an Islamic. This transformation had a number of implications. Geopolitics and shifting alliances. With intra the ideological changes in Khartoum and the removal of Hassan al Turabi from power in 1999, Sudan regional links began to show signs of interest in normalizing relations with neighboring and international communities. Uh, in the wake of the South Sudan secession uh, in 19. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, and Khartoum's subsequent loss of oil revenue and economic and financial crisis, it was the Qatari's financial assistant that rescued the Khartoum government, but the Qatari rule is not confined to financial and economic assistance. In all Qatar's moves in these regions, Sudan is seen as a strategic player. Over the years, Sudan has also cultivated special relations with Iran and Turkey. Iran was instrumental in assisting Sudan's arms industry. Press reports referred to incidents in which Sudan was implicated in arms transfers to Hamas in Gaza and the Houthis in Yemen and the jihadist group in Libya. Military, security, economic, regional relations. A number of studies have shed light on the economics of the military in Sudan documenting the systematic and increasing involvement by the Sudanese army in economic and business activities. One important sector is the production of military equipment, uh, which was in the, after the formation of the Military Industrial Corporation. International factors, and I'll try to shorten. Oh, I have only three, two more minutes. The radical policies adopted by the Inqad regime ushered in a realignment of the country away from the Western countries to move towards strengthening relations with the China and Asian countries. U.S. West boycott and war on terror and Sudan. Relations between Sudan and Western powers, U.S. and Europe, passed through different phases from 80 to 2019 during which relations were characterized by mutual animosity, U.S. imposed sanctions, and other Western powers showed no interest in working with Sudan. But after 1999 and the split with the ruling Islamic movement and the removal of Hassan al-Turabi from power, Khartoum sent signs to soften ideological drive and normalize relations with international community. The global war on terror and Sudan is following the succession of South Sudan, the cessation of South Sudan, an objective in the realization and the realization which Western countries had invested heavily, the international community seemed to have lost interest in following it through with an agenda for democratic reforms as stipulated uh, in the relationship with Sudan. And the West remained in limbo. Sudan. I, I will finish with a few, a few statements. Sudan-West relations remained in limbo and characterized by ambivalence. On the one hand, Western countries valued their intelligence cooperation with Sudan in tracking the activities of the radical Islamists, but on the other, they were not yet ready to allow Sudan to join the international community. The military security nexus expanded greatly during the oil decade, yet paradoxically gradual transformation of the regime from military to a one party and eventually a personalist autocracy has increased its share of the government budget in its potential political role has been circumvented. Let me conclude 
local, regional, and international factors have in interacted and built each other in historic process that took off early 50s. Both civilians and military leaders were confronted with awesome tasks of national agenda, uniting a diverse Sudanese nation, building inclusive and representative state institutions where Sudanese feel equal and attend to the economy to deliver basic services and development goods. As things now stand, Sudan, the region of Horn of Africa and Red Sea is in turmoil, emerging as a security region, almost competing with North Africa, Middle East, and the Arab Gulf in security risks it harbors as a result of fallouts of failed Arab Spring. World and regional powers are very to are vying to have stronghold in the area of Iran-Arab rivalry in Yemen, Europe, Turkey, Russia, USA, and Israel are watching carefully developments in the region, not to mention China and India. While Sudan geopolitics is not far away from actions and interactions that are playing out by the day, one conclusion one may arrive at is that the story of civil military relations in Sudan is, in a way, the obitum, the epitome of the evolution and decline of state building institutions in a post colonial crisis ridden society faced with regional and worldwide challenges. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite the second speaker uh, to deliver his speech titled uh, The Sudanese Islamic Movement and the Military from 1989 to 2019, How, Where and When Things Gone Wrong. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Mahjoub Harun. Bismillah ar rahim First, let me uh, um, thank um, SIGA, uh, ICU, um, and Dr. Sam and his team for uh, making, making it possible for us to join uh, you in this conference and uh, uh, to benefit from uh, um, getting to know um, some new friends and uh, further network with them. Um, my paper um, is uh, on Sudanese Islamist uh, the military and power uh, where uh, when and how things had gone wrong. Um, I, I'm, I'll try to be quick and uh, uh, to uh, uh, also uh, uh, try to, uh, to summarize as much as, uh, as I can um, uh, a relatively long paper in a, such a short time. But anyway, <coughs> uh, um, in authoring this paper, I... Um, I adopted uh, a historical approach together with, uh, with doing some discourse analysis and uh, um, um, also uh, adopting a political psychology approach. Um, um, the Sudanese Islamist, oh, also uh, I refer to as the Sudanese Islamist movement, um, um, has seen uh, the, the day of the life sometime back in the in mid 1940s, and uh, it was basically formed of uh, of, of students um, uh, coming from two uh, two different uh, um, uh, backgrounds. Um, the first uh, uh, membership uh, of uh, of the movement were formed of students coming back from uh, studying in Egyptian universities, and uh, the other fold was uh, formed from universities, university students at the then uh, Gordon Memorial College, uh, which uh, uh, later became the University of Khartoum. Um, um, uh, this movement has, has, has taken uh, quite a number of names, and um, the, this uh, continuous uh, change of naming was also due to uh, uh, changing roles in Sudanese uh, political life. So uh, first it was known as the Muslim uh, Brothers. 
and then it uh, took some some uh, some new names, uh, including the Islamic Constitution uh, uh, uh, movement, the Islamic Charter movement, and uh, um, when it came to power in alliance with the army in 1989, it was called the National Islamic Front. So. Uh, Uh, for quite some time, uh, the Sudan Islamist movement and uh, the Sudan Islamist movement is, by the way, the mainstream Sudanese Islamic uh, uh, uh, group because uh, the, there is um, a larger Islamist basin with some other movements yani, on this side or the other. But uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which ended up as the Isla uh, National Islamic Front, represents the main the mainstream Islamist movement uh, in Sudan. And uh, uh, during the early days of, uh, of, uh, of uh, so the, the Sudan Islamic, Islamic movement, which I call SIM uh, in brief, uh, um, was, it was caught in a bit of uh, left-wing, right-wing kind of political struggle within uh, the uh, uh, Sudanese uh, single university by that time, the University of Khartoum. And uh, uh, in a way, the Sudanese Islamic movement at that time was a bit of uh, an, a, uh, a resistance movement for the growing uh, left-wing movement with the Communist Party being right at the center of it. So uh, when it was uh, a largely Elite, an elitist student movement, and two, it was rather an opposition movement for the then uh, left-wing uh, politics in Sudan uh, Su and the University of Khartoum. Of course, and this uh, uh, has been the case for quite some time. Um, the struggle was uh, on and off, and uh, um, but uh, um, the the seam started to. Uh, to, to grow and uh, with um, an expanded control over student politics till uh, there come, come a point where they managed to uh, uh, um, to outmaneuver the left wing uh, political movement uh, in the in the university and even in the um, general education at, uh, in the secondary schools in Sudan. That was the case uh, uh, during the 1960s, uh, all the way to the 1970s. And when it was uh, sometime towards the end of the 1970s, um, the Sudanese Islamic movement uh, managed to uh, almost fully control the student politics, uh, while at the same time uh, it was uh, keeping an eye on uh, national pol politics outside the university campus. Uh, when landmark development in the history of uh, of uh, of SIM uh, uh, took place sometime towards the mid 1960s, uh, and uh, this is uh, a period which I, the paper, uh, uh, uh, tends to call at uh, Turabi's era, and. Uh, um, this is about the period when Dr. Hassan al-Turabi, the late uh, Dr. Hassan al-Turabi, uh, was uh, playing such a central role in shaping uh, the Sudanese Islamic movement. And it appears that uh, um, the October 21st, 1964, popular uprising against the military regime of uh, General Ibrahim Aboud in, in, in Khartoum uh, was to bring about uh, some good news to the then a largely student-based uh, Sudanese Islamic movement. Um, um, Dr. Hassan al-Turabi, who was uh, just back uh, from, uh, um, from Europe with a PhD in uh, constitutional law, managed to daringly uh, um, mobilize the masses in 1964 in, in, in an event which uh, uh, 
triggered the October 1964 revolution against the, the, the, the government of the day, which was the government of General Ibrahim Aboud. It was a military government. By then, um, uh, uh, the, that government was, uh, uh, it lasted from 1957 all the way to 1964. Then um, um, a, a democratic government uh, came into place. By then, uh, the Turabi's era markedly was marked from then on at the Turabi era, markedly instrumental in shaping the future Sudan Islamist political movement uh, was born into existence. At Turabi had in fact gone well beyond that limit by playing an influential role in drawing the, count, the contour lines of the political realities of both Sudan and the Sunni Muslim world from the mid 1960s uh, till uh, the day of his death in two, uh, 2016. So uh, uh, this is about uh, the role of Dr. Trabi in shaping the, um, um, the Sudanese Islamist movement. Then uh, uh, sometime towards the end of the 1960s, uh, Sudan uh, was in a rendezvous uh, again with uh, military uh, uh, rule. Uh, that was when General Nimeri, um, back in my, May 1969, uh, um, came to power by a military coup. And uh, this coup was also another landmark in the development, political development of, of the Sudanese Islamic movement, where uh, uh, it has chosen uh, to go for uh, a first high profile role in, in national politics. Formerly, it used to be a uh, um, as I mentioned, um, a small elitist student movement. Uh, but by then, uh, it was face-to-face uh, uh, -face with the challenge of uh, entering uh, the larger national political arena. And uh, uh, uh, in that, uh, the uh, Sudan Islamic movement uh, contributed to uh, establishing a political an armed political alliance in opposition of the military government of General Jafar Nimeri. Uh, but uh, uh, after a failed uh, armed attempt to depose the government of Nimeri uh, in 1976, uh, the uh, National Front, that's the alliance which brought together Um, after that uh, failed attempt, uh, the uh, National Front, which was formed uh, of the uh, Sudanese Islamist movement and two other uh, uh, Sudanese political parties, the Umma Party and the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, they chose to, uh, to join an initiative that called for a national reconciliation with the government of the day, with the government of uh, President Nimeri. So, uh, um, they uh, dissolved the front, they almost dissolved, dissolved it, and joined the government of Jafar Nimeri in 1978. Uh, um, and that was a bit of a golden time for um, the uh, Sudanese Islamic, Islamic movement, which um, saw that as an opportunity uh, to further expand its role in Sudanese political uh, arena. Right. Um. Then uh, um, uh, the Sudan Islamic movement used that, that epoch in the 1978-1985 uh, to invest in building um, a rather um, stronger um, political movement in, in Sudan. Um, it was uh, 
uh, focusing on how to uh, uh, to grab power, whether by the uh, through a ballot box, a ballot box, or by the peril of the gun. Anyway, um, uh, there was um, such a, a good central planning by by by by Sim uh, to to grow its organization, and. Uh, Soon uh, after, uh, by the end of that, that, that, uh, that epoch in 1985, another popular uprising took place in Sudan, where uh, the uh, uh, government, the military government of President Timeri has uh, been brought to an end. And uh, um, general election has taken place in 1986, and uh, due to uh, the growth uh, that the Sudan Islamic movement managed, uh, to uh, to make uh, it managed to uh, to win 52 parliamentary seats uh, in in that general election by and by this it uh, it managed to become the third largest political party in the parliament. Uh, Right, uh, so uh, um, from a small elitist uh, political group, the Sudan Islamic movement ended into uh, quite a middle-sized political uh, party in Sudan uh, by the mid-1980s. Um, uh, um, okay, right. Then uh, there, um, um, let, let me just shift to uh, talking about what I called from organizational development to mission conceptualization, uh, which I also uh, uh, called in the paper construction of a paradigm. And this is uh, about uh, um, how the Sudanese Islamic movement identified its political mission, what kind of a, a movement it wanted itself to be like. And uh, uh, this, this was both simple and, and, and complex for, for Sudanese Islamists. Uh, and it was simple uh, just like when it's, uh, uh, when um, um, uh, a child is back from a KG in the end of the day and asked by, by, by his mother what what what was your your day like? What they gave you in the uh, in the KG today? Uh, it's uh, only natural that uh, he says they gave us uh, juice and, and sweet. Uh, or when it's uh, it's a, break, a pregnant lady, ladies, all about uh, giving a birth to a baby, isn't it? Or uh, so for the Sudan Islamist, it was the the identifica identification of the mission was like. Uh, um, uh, the mission is about instating the Islamic State. So it was all about a political mission, and it's such a big claim in instating the Islamic State. It's not just an Islamic State, but it's about instating the Islamic State. Of course, for this, uh, the Sudanese Islamist movement uh, uh, needed some time to, to settle some um, uh, internal kind of, of conflict about how to identify the mission of, of, of, of the movement. But anyway, uh, the, the uh, founding fathers of the movement who were advocating this identity for, the, for SIM managed to, uh, to win the game against their opponents. And since then, the uh, uh, SIM was uh, seriously focusing on how to uh, to arrive at, at such an end uh, in stating uh, an Islamic movement. Anyway, uh, uh, a huge organizational uh, uh, development has taken place. A huge investment has been uh, uh, done uh, to enable, to uh, just to put SIM in such a position that it becomes ready uh, to, uh, uh, to reach that end. And um, among other factors, this was one reason why uh, by 1989 it was the choice of SIM to uh, uh, um, this time uh, grab power by, by force, by, through an alliance with uh, uh, 
Islamist officers in the, in the National Army, and that was the period where uh, the, what the Sudanese Islamists used to call the uh, Islamic uh, project of Sudan uh, came to existence. Anyway, uh, that's a long story, of course, and uh, there, there is just no, not enough time uh, to, uh, to, go, to go through uh, uh, all chapters of that uh, epoch of uh, um, the Sudan Islamic movement, Islamic movement. But anyway, uh, um, after 30 years in power, 1989 to, 19, uh, to 2019, of course, uh, there are some lessons learned. Of course, I mean, yeah, um, the paper will, will make available some, some more services for, for you to, uh, uh, to, to go through, but uh, let me just uh, end up by uh, a, sum a summary about what, uh, what the lessons learned from uh, 30 years in, in power uh, um, in an alliance between the civilian and military Islamists in Sudan. I think uh, one, one big lesson to, uh, to learn and uh, um, um, um, an area for uh, a genuine deep uh, rethinking of, uh, b based on that experience is the notion of instating not only an Islamic state, but the Islamic state in such, uh, though Islamic, but also multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious society such as the Sudanese society. Um, the political experience based on, on uh, um, endeavoring to realize that notion in stating the Islamic State, of course, has brought about a lot of uh, uh, issues to, to reckon with, to consider, to, uh, to use as substance for, for um, rethinking. Uh, uh, the other issue, I think, is uh, um, the, uh, what I call the illegitimacy complex. Um, uh, Sim has come to power um, by, by military force. That has posed a serious question on how legitimate coming to, to power using the peril of the gun is for uh, an, an Islamic movement. Um, uh, it looks like the uh, uh, uh, seeming power during that period has been living with this, with such uh, um, uh, uh, an, uh, an illegitimacy complex, and that many, uh, uh, managed to shape the pattern of, of public conduct of the state. Is it the state of the citizens of Sudan, or it is our state? Uh, of course, that that that. Uh, um, uh, has drawn the contours of that experience in government for Sudanese Islamists. Uh, that also has, uh, uh, is to bring to, to, to discussion the issue of ruling uh, through a single uh, uh, party kind of politics. Of course, it was a military government, of course, um, and, and that's a kind of a dictatorship. But that dictatorship also was based on a single party in what used to be a multi-party political society in Sudan. Uh, lastly, lastly, um, gambling, gambling on uh, uh, coming to power and sustaining power uh, using military force and establishing a kind of a military dictatorship and uh, um, uh, having a, a single party military government uh, has brought about some multiplicity within. It has brought uh, the Sudanese, uh, the ruling Sudanese Islamic movement to a situation where they started to see the enemy within, the enemy within ourselves, the, the, the, the conflict and dispute within the party. So. Uh, that was also, in, in a way, um, a point where uh, that, uh, that movement started to disintegrate from within. Um, all in all, I think uh, um, um, the experience in, in, uh, of uh, power that came uh, through an alliance between the civilian and military Sudanese Islamists uh, was, 
full of, of lessons to learn. And I think uh, the challenge that's left after uh, that experience has been brought to an end by the uh, April 11, 2019, uh, uh, third popular political uprising in Sudan, uh, what is left to be to be learned is how to uh, uh, to think back and, uh, and and read through such uh, diverse, rich, and very much controversial uh, experience in politics for the Sudan Islamic movement. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Uh, now uh, come to our last uh, presenter, um, Dr. Asadik Al Faki. Uh, will speak on the role of elites defining the complex civilian military relations. Assalamu yes. <coughs> alaikum. Uh, first, allow me to extend my sincere thanks to SEGA and especially to Dr. Samuel Arian for uh, availing me this opportunity uh, to be here with you uh, in the last uh, few days. Um, it is good to be last because uh, there is a lot of things you don't need to talk about, especially the history. And I put some uh, uh, foot, uh, uh, notes which I don't want to go through uh, because they represent the established facts and many of what had been said uh, by my two colleagues are part of those established facts. And established facts in the Sudanese politics, especially when it comes to the relations between civilians and military, are not necessarily all true um, because um, the history of the Sudan is very different when it comes to this particular issue of uh, civilian and military. Uh, probably because of the experience of our political elites uh, since the days of, uh, of the colonialists uh, when they started uh, their civil struggle Again, it's a colonial rule, which, is, was, which was very strange. It had never happened in any other country because uh, when the British were defeated earlier by the Mahdists, they came in a different form for the second time. They occupied Egypt and the Sudan, and they came in a very small number as a mandatory system in the Sudan, and they brought few administrators from Egypt, and they left the local administration uh, intact. So we had three layers of uh, governance, and they call it also a strange name, condominium, uh, the condominium role. So the, the, the graduates organized themselves, the, or the political elites, in clubs, and they started working against the, the, the government. And I think they staged the first, for me, I consider it the first coup, not against uh, uh, a, a, a national government, but again, is the colonialists themselves, because uh, even our independence, it came in a very strange way. The, the, the parliamentarians who happened to be there during the British uh, or the condominium rule in December 19th of 55, just less than one month from actual, our actual independence, they declared independence from within the parliament itself. So they staged a coup, a civil coup, against the colonialists. Uh, the relation between civil and uh, civilians or the political elites and the military is always very peculiar uh, to Sudan, and uh, I don't think there is a match anywhere else. They're, they're, they're our elites, political elites, are so fond of the military, and they have excessive respect for the, law, the role of the military in politics. No military coup are led or is led by military. All the military coups attempted, failed, successful military coups were motivated, driven, and led 
by civilian politicians, elites. Uh, the first government, we were fortunate enough to have a civilian government immediately when we got our independence in January uh, uh, 56. Uh, but soon the politicians start quarreling and start disagreeing, start making a lot of uh, problems to themselves. So the first military coup of General Ibrahim Aboud was not a military, he, he, was, he was a defense minister at the time. He was called in by the Ummah party who shared more than half of the, of, the, of, the, of the power, civilian power at the time, to take over. So he was invited to take over, and that was the first military government which continued to be intact as a military from that, uh, from, in, from 1958 all the way to 64. But within those seven years or six years, we witnessed also many coups led by uh, political elites, but they, they used the military uh, to go for it. Uh, the first one, less than one year, uh, we had, less than one year we had uh, an attempted coup led by Ismail Kibeda. Uh, there is a political uh, motivation behind him and in 59, the Islamic movement, it is not only 89. 59, Rashid al-Tahir Bakr, the leader of the Islamic movement at the time, individually also uh, conspired against the government and he attempted a military coup against the then uh, military government of General uh, Ibrahim Aboud. And the things go went on. Uh, so many coups within the coups, but all uh, the military or the civilians who were, uh, who were behind uh, those coups. How can't, uh... So we had at least, at least known uh, 13 or more political coups. Every and each one of them uh, led by political elites. No political party in the country uh, who had no attempted a political coup. And this is well recorded in the history uh, of the country, and, and uh, including the recent, the recent ones. The revolutions that took place in, in 64 and uh, 50, uh, 85 and, and, and uh, 2019 are all led by also by political uh, elites, but also they invited the military to join in. Uh, it is not the military that uh, voluntarily uh, crept in uh, to be in power, but they invited the military to be in. I, I'm not going to uh, go over the history, but I want just to show this. These are political uh, uh, military coups took place in the country. And each one of them, there is a political party or multiple or political parties or political elites who were behind all the military coups. And this is not, not, uh, had not been denied by any political forces uh, in the Sudan or by any historians uh, in the Sudan. All the political parties in the country have been propelled and, uh, by uh, political elites uh, in, in, in the country. The political parties or the military who ruled for over 52 years uh, since our independence, it, is, it was not really a, a, a military because those who uh, pushed the military to, talk, to take over from the political parties, they came in also and joined the political, uh, the political uh, processes of those military, military rules. With the exception of Abu time, Numeri time went through so many transformation in which or, or in, in which all the political parties participated. It was not only uh, an static military rule for 16 years, but all the political parties participated in those uh, 16 years. And they also organized elections within those uh, periods of, uh, of military rule uh, in the country. Uh, uh, we have, uh, since Numeri came, uh, we had, uh, we had the uh, Addis Ababa agreement by which 
Southern Sudan has been given an autonomous rule and became part of the government with civilian participation. And also, all the political parties also participated in many elections organized during those 16 years of uh, General Numeri. Not, uh, not only the Southerners, but uh, the National Front, which fought against Numeri from uh, the trained and organized militarily uh, in Libya and in, in, in Ethiopia, and they came and uh, tried to topple the government through a military uh, invasion. Uh, they failed, but uh, one year later, in 77, as uh, Dr. Mohamed Mahjoub mentioned, they uh, reached uh, an agreement with Numeri, or a reconciliation, as they called it, and they joined the government of the National Party, including the Islamic, uh, Islamic Front, the Umma Party, the Unionist, and the Islamic Front and other smaller political parties join uh, Numeri regime. Uh, and they continued uh, as part of the military government of uh, Numeri for a long uh, time. Even the al-Bashir government, uh, when he came, as uh, has been mentioned, uh, the Islamic Front was behind uh, the, the, the, the staging of, uh, of, of the coup. We don't like to... This is why in Sudan they don't like to call it coup or in Qilab. They always call it Thawra because they know that it is not, uh, it is not a military who made the coup, but the, civili the civilians who are the ones who organized it. This is why there is a, almost a prohibition not to call uh, any political coup as a coup. Uh, we never th in, in the last 30 years, we never, we never said that uh, al-Bashir government was a coup, but uh, rather a Thawra or a revolution against the old corrupt civilian governments because the civilians uh, took three terms of multi-party system uh, without any kind of military participation, but soon they failed to deliver. Even the first statement of General Aboud, which came just less than uh, three years of the first term, term of the first government, talked about the corruption, talked about the patience of the military running out because of the uh, quarreling political, uh, political elites and political parties. This is why they had to take over so to correct and restore order. And also, uh, they always declaring. Uh, this, this, that statement of General Abut became a blueprint. Every coup, uh, at, uh, attempted coup or a successful coup in the country, took the same line uh, or the same statement as if they cut and uh, paste that uh, they're always coming to restore order, to stop corruption, and also to stop uh, the inability of political parties in ruling uh, the country and affecting uh, the rule of law uh, in the country and also realizing the development that uh, the country is always crying uh, for. Uh, as a huge country with lots of resources, but un underdeveloped uh, or continue to be underdeveloped. So if you, if you see, if you can see it clearly, uh, uh, the Umar Party, uh, 58, Muslim Brotherhood, nine, uh, 59, uh, United uh, France, plus the military, 64, that is a revolution. Uh, communist, Arab nationalist, Baathist, 1969. Communist again, uh, 71. Because they wanted to take it to take to take over the whole thing. They participated, and they have a military representative who's in the Numeri regime. At the, when they took over in May of uh, uh, 96, but uh, one year later they decided to take over. Uh, everything. Even 69, when the military came, they came with the civilians with them, including a very famous judge, Babikra um, Audallah. So always there is, uh, there is civilians within the military and within the first government that the military forms in the country. There is always civilians who are who were actively participating in the staging of different uh, military coup. So uh, the National Front also um, uh, 
there is one military which we uh, uh, or one uh, military coup or an attempted coup of uh, 74 uh, in which individual judges, uh, lawyers, uh, were, were behind uh, the attempted coup, not a political, not a non-political party. The National Front came back on, six, on 76, uh, as I said, from, uh, from Libya and, uh, and, uh, and Ethiopia, and they, they, they staged uh, an attempted coup against the uh, Numeri government. SPLM, of course, they revolted. They were military and also civilian political elites from Southern Sudan, they revolted against the central government uh, in 83. One of the things I just want to correct it from what uh, my brother Ali Abu Zaku said in Atal Bathani's paper, um, not because Nimeri declared Sharia in 83, or the Islamists tried to impose Islamic laws in 83 that the rebellions in the Southern Sudan erupted. Uh, the rebellion, rebellion erupted uh, actually in, uh, because Numeri ended the aut autonomous rule dictated by Addis Ababa uh, of 1972. Uh, so the, the rebellion started in, in, in May of that year, 83, and Numeri later on declared in September, this is why they call it some September laws in the Sudan. The Sharia laws call it the September laws, and that in itself uh, negate the idea uh, that uh, the, because of the Sharia laws, the rebellion started again uh, in southern Sudan. So they, they, they uh, actually staged a coup inside uh, the barracks of the military in southern Sudan in 83, uh, led by Dr. John Garang, who was uh, a colonel in the Sudanese uh, army. Uh, the National Revolt of uh, 83, as, as I said, that it's a military and also uh, political elites. Uh, the National uh, Islamic Front of uh, 80, 89, before that, uh, yeah, it, it, the, the, the revolt of, uh, or the revolution of 85. The revolution of 85 actually organized by what we called then the modern forces, the trade unions, the NGOs, and many uh, smaller political parties uh, at the time. Uh, that was uh, uh, 85. 89 came the Islamic movement, and I think uh, Dr. Mohammed Mahjoub uh, said a lot about that. Uh, the Ummah party attempted a coup against uh, al-Bashir in, in, in 1990. Uh, it's an uh, aborted uh, attempt. Uh, many officers from the Homo Party uh, tried to stage a coup in, in 1990. Uh, among them, my, my, my own uncle is a, a general at the time. The Arab Socialist uh, or, and the Basque Party in 1990 also tried almost a successful uh, coup. We had, I remember vividly I had to call the Iraqi ambassador early in the morning before the, uh, fri before the morning uh, or the Fajr prayer to tell him that uh, you are no longer um, accepted, uh, accepted here because he was part and parcel of the preparation uh, uh, with the Basis party in making that uh, coup. They, they went and uh, they tried to uh, occupy the, uh, the the airport, and uh, if you can, if you remember, there is a, a plane, military plane, crashed in Saudi Arabia, carrying special arms from Iraq to that uh, military uh, coup uh, in in in the Sudan in, in 1990. Uh, the Ba'ath Party also in 92 uh, tried another coup. Uh, in 83, uh, political elites from western part of the country, from Darfur also, organized many military movements uh, to take over uh, the government. They even uh, attempted to invade uh, the capital city, Khartoum, uh, to, to, to make the change through, uh, but they are all uh, politicians and political elites who formed uh, rebellions, uh, military rebels, or military organizations 
in Darfur in, in, in 2003. Uh, the SPLM was behind them, the, the leftists were behind them at the beginning, but later on, even Islamists uh, organized their own uh, military groups or rebellions uh, in, in Darfur and continued always is, is dredging uh, until today. Uh, it's less than it used to be, less effective than it used to be, but they are still not part of the political process uh, of the country. Uh, the, the Popular Congress also accused of uh, staging a military coup in 2004, and so many other coups undeclared and announced. Even uh, in the last uh, revolution, we had three governments in three days. Al-Bashir, Ibn Auf, and Al-Burhan uh, came uh, after, in, in just three days. And till now, they claim to have discovered six military attempts, military coups. And I'm sure all, if, if they are true, all those military coups or military attempts to overthrow the government, uh, they will be uh, politicians or political elites uh, behind them. Um, I just want to say a few things about uh, the latest or the power sharing, uh, which took place after, after, after, after the revolution. Um, if you can recall all the calls from, uh, from the United Nations, from the African unions, from all kind of organizations that they would like the military to step aside, not completely, but they would like a, a civilian-led government, not a civilian government, not an elected government, but a civilian-led government. There is a recognition, uh, not only in the country, but even abroad, that the military has to be part and parcel of any composition of any government because of the situation. Uh, of the Sudan, the insecurity or the rebellions in different parts of the, it's a huge country, it will affect so many neighbors. If left for weak political organizations or weak politicians, it might not stay as united, as strong, and it might not be able to keep its borders. And you know there's a, a transnational or global problems now, including the uh, human trafficking and others, uh, Sudan is, is very, very important uh, to be kept uh, intact and to be kept guarded. This is why none of the claims, none of the requests from the international community, from the regional community ask for the military to completely step aside, but they ask for a civil, civilian-led government. And, and the civilian-led government with the military composition as a Supreme Council leading, leading, leading the country are getting much of the support and much of the contacts, I'm sure, are with the military rather than with the, with the civilians uh, right now because they know that the authority rests there. Um, so the, the politicians and the elites of the country are the one who are, or they're supposed to take the blame of all the uh, the, the, the political or the military uh, coups and military coup attempts uh, in the country and also um, to share the blame of not working hard or working diligently to, to perfect uh, the process of democracy, the process of elected governments since the country was blessed to begin with that form of government. We, we started with the civilian government, but we spent more than 52 years of a military type governments, uh, of governments, but they are not totally military. There are always been, uh, there's always been uh, uh, elites and political parties behind those uh, governments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asadik. Um, I have um, some comments and a few questions here. Um, Dr. Al-Badhani uh, uh, mentioned in his paper that um, 
Civil society has been weakened by many factors, uh, such as a militaristic approach, uh, a failure economic model, and the jihadist approach of the last regime. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, with uh, the current political transformation in, uh, in, in Sudan, uh, present a new example of, of civil society's ability um, to impose its will on the ruling military. Um, the uh, SPA, the Sudanese uh, Professional Association, for example, uh, successfully mobilizing international support. So my question here is that, uh, what are the models for both government and economic development uh, for the Sudan in order to achieve the democratic uh, governance? Uh, this is uh, even Professor uh, uh, uh, Harun also can can respond to this uh, because it's interrelated. Uh, so it was mentioned in the paper of uh, the Al Batani. Yeah, uh, and uh, I say it again. Yes, uh, I'm talking about uh, the statement of uh, Professor Al Batani speaking about the weakened. Uh, the, the factor that lead to weakening uh, civil society, uh, for example, um, like a military approach, uh, jihadist movement, and also the failure of economic uh, uh, development system. So uh, my question is, what are the models you, you propose, or both of you propose, for the new government or for the uh, uh, democratic uh, governance? And my other questions is about um, uh, Dr. Harun uh, doesn't uh, highlight at all about one of the most important factors that also contribute to the, um, to the failure of economic uh, system in Sudan, which is tribalism. And there is another, uh, another comment uh, about the... Um, uh, uh, Dr. Harun, you mentioned that um, the, the, the last government or the last regime in particular, SIM, Sudan Islamic Movement, they have this uh, kind of, or they are rather suffering from obsessive, uh, uh, compulsive neurotic behavior, which is very strong. That's why uh, make the movement uh, dysfunction. Uh, so, uh, but you, you because you, your your exposition of Islamic movement is started from very early stage, and you mention you have no mention you mention um, about many of them uh, a lot of of course with this neg negative aspect. But there are I think I think uh, just to be just to some of the Islamists, uh, for example, a figure like uh, Abdullah uh, Sadiq Abdullah and the group. They are, they are uh, different. I mean, uh, definitely we cannot uh, accuse them of suffering from obsessive, uh, compulsive neurosis behavior. But, uh, but the, the power not with them. Uh, but they are doing a lot of effort, I think, to go against this kind of uh, loss of power in controlling the country. And about the military relation um, in Sudan, uh, it is like, you know, it is like, uh, because the Sudanese people are very unique. They have the Sufis, they have uh, different, different group and different ideologies and different ethnic, multi-ethnic religious society. Um, but they have kind of rela special relationship with army, love and hate or love-hate relationship. This is my comment. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, I start from this side. I can see one from here. Okay. And another one, Professor. Yes. Thank you for this lecture. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one for Dr. Sadek uh, regarding uh, new lectures. It seems to me that uh, the military, Sudanese military, is in, on all the time, uh, it was reactionary reactive for what civilians ask them to do. But I, th I don't know, I'm not specialized in Sudanese politics, but uh, uh, where can we find the self-interest of the Sudanese military institutions? 
uh, I can expect that they can send indirect message for civilians to ask them to come to, to the power because this is their self-interest or they want to come to the power. But at the end of the day, it looks like that civilians ask them to come to the power. This is not our interest. So uh, could this uh, be in the Sudanese case or it's the fault all, almost in the civilians? The second question to the panelists. Uh, I would like to hear uh, more about El Gangaweed and Hamidity because I think right now uh, military is not just the Sudanese army. So uh, could we uh, in the future see a competition between both of them or civilians can play in one side and, uh, and others? So uh, someone could elaborate on this. Thank you. Okay. Second question, please. Thank you very much for all speakers. I have two or three comments. The first one, could you please elaborate on the current situations? What is the, the impact and the forces of the militaries, the Islamists, and the civil society? Who, who, who is winning this part? Is it possible to understand that to go back to the history? In the, in the 60s and 70s, the left wing, led by a communist, was very, very strong. It was the strongest in the Arab world. And we have, you know, at, the, at the same time, the, the rise of the Islamist movement. And there, the Ummah party. Finally, for a set of very complicated reasons, the Islamists won. The question is, during this period of time, very, very critical for nationalism Arab. What was the role of the external players? Now, I have a very short comment on, on the third speaker. He made very strong call for the military rule on the assumption of the external threat. Now we have a lot of external threat, uh, France and <coughs> Bin Laden and so on. I think the real threat in the Arab regimes are the military themselves. It is the rule of the military. In every single country in this region, the military budget is very, very, very high to the detriment of the promotion of civil society. Thank you. Can we have, okay, third questions. Uh, Prof. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, very quick questions. First to Dr. Haroun. Uh, the Islamic experiment when they took over power by, by military force in 1989, is there a revision? Is Are people now saying, was the paradigm wrong, that we should not have done this, that we should have done the, the hardest way? Are there any regrets? Or is it just mismanagement? How do they see it and how do you see it? Secondly, for Dr. Saleh on the role of the elites after all these failed coups and after the, the, uh, the way that Sudan has been uh, basically butchered into two different countries, all these mismanagements, are there now, are the elites revising and they said, our problem actually is that we need to work together and find a way so that we can have uh, politics without the military or, or are they still insisting that we need to, to, to come to power and our enemies are each other rather than a, a structured military presence where because the way the military thinks is top down, they never go you know, back and forth. It's just the given order and that's how it is. And structuring society along these lines obviously is detrimental. And thirdly, uh, the, uh, I didn't hear much about the role of foreign interference. And, you know, and I would like to, to, to hear more about what the Emiratis are doing now with, and, and the other forces and Americans and others. And also since I have Dr. Abu Zakuk there, also I wanna hear more about Haftar and the experiment of, of, of him also as, as, as, as a former military general who's trying actually now to take over Libya with the aid of foreign interference. I need to also uh, hear a little bit about that. Thank you. He takes one more question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first question is an extension of a previous one, which is actually who is using who? Yani I got the impression that the, the civilians are using the military to achieve their objectives. 
However, when the military come to power, they actually impose military rules. So it's at the end of the day, it looks like the military uh, is using the, the civilians. Second question is, what I, يعني, also I got the impression that you did not classify the last events in 2019 like all the previous ones. Uh, is this a case or it is just another case of maybe 20 more cases before that? And, and, and it is simply uh, uh, another case of utilizing military in changing uh, the, the, current, uh, the current situation then at that time. And finally, last question is what do you think, يعني, uh, Dr. Faqih and, and Dr. Harun, what do you think the, the future of the current arrangement in Sudan uh, will be? And how, is, it, is, it intact, is it an intact agreement or it's going to turn one way or the other. Thank you. Okay, I take uh, two more questions at the back there. Only two more questions. Uh, make it short and sweet. Well, thank you. I think they were very useful uh, uh, commentaries on the Sudanese case. Um, uh, I am outsider. I have very little knowledge about the Sudanese case. So my question is that uh, after the partition of Sudan into South Sudan, so what is the relationship between the two militaries? Were they divided uh, across these two countries? And what was the role of the regional international powers in the partition of the country? Thank you. Ne next. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Uh, my question is for Dr. Harun. Uh, can I ask you what makes the army always turn on the people? They are coming from the same society. Why does he turn their back to the people and start killing them? Uh, my second question is for all the speakers. Is there is any chance for a civilian government in Sudan to success? Thank you. Okay. Last one we, we give to uh, Ambassador. Yes. Yes. yes. yes. No, a very short Thank question. You. I just um, wanted to direct it to Dr. Harun. Would you describe 1989 as a convergence of two original sins? When civilians, whether they be Islamists or elites, when they get into power through military means, the original sin of illegitimacy remains. And when a military tastes power, they are unable to relinquish power once they have tasted it. And they often treat every problem as a military solution that is required rather than a civilian solution. So I'm just trying to think of these convergences of two original sins um, in 1989 based on your analysis that you have done. Okay, uh, each of presenters has five minutes to respond. Okay, thank you. Um, um, starting with, uh, with um, um, the question raised by Ambassador uh, Rasul and, and Dr. Sami, what happened in 1989? Was it a kind of um, um, a wrong paradigm uh, in the first place or just mismanagement and uh, by allying with uh, the military, no matter whether they are Islamist or, or non-Islamist, uh, uh, was that uh, such an arrangement that uh, would have ended up with uh, uh, setting up a kind of a democracy and that the military doesn't uh, claim uh, uh, the power and eat the whole cake themselves. I, uh, to, me, to me, after, after 30 years of, of, of engagement, uh, uh, in, in politics from an Islamist position, of course. Uh, I would see what happened in 1989 as rather uh, a wrong paradigm. Uh, if, uh, any, uh, if, if we are taken back 30 years back, I wouldn't have opted for, the, for Sim to, go, uh, to take power that way, that way. And uh, the reason why it, uh, I see it as a wrong paradigm is um, it's, it's so difficult to, uh, to establish a democracy if uh, that situation is lacking leg legitimacy. Um, uh, and and um, I think we, we uh, most of us can agree upon uh, w how can we define legitimacy. The best form of legitimacy is the case where you uh, you come to power uh, uh, by the choice of of the people, 
of the people. Um, once that's not the case, then um, um, um, uh, the legitimacy of, of that uh, government is, is, is questioned. It's questioned. And I think this is uh, one basic issue that uh, um, the, uh, the uh, coming to, to, to power in 1989 by, Islam, by the Sudan Islamist remained uh, uh, obsessed with. That's, that's, that's what I, I tended to call um, a state of, of an obsessive compulsion not necessarily a neurosis, uh, uh, doctor. Doctor. Um, yes. Yes. Correct. I, I mentioned that, and um, um, I think it's, it was a bit strong uh, in that in that in that context. But anyway, um, once you uh, a government is having um, a, a feeling that it is an illegitimate government or it lacks illeg a legitimacy, then that in in uh, will will make a shift with regard to the functions of the state, of the government structures, how, how, how, how they behave. In the, in the case of Sudan, um, uh, this went on like this. Uh, first, uh, the government, which was having a sense of, of less legitimacy or no legitimacy, started to be concerned about how to sustain itself in power in the first place, not to focus on the business of a government uh, uh, uh, for its own citizens, its own, own people. So uh, the entire conduct of government structure started to, uh, to, to transform from focus on g uh, providing service to people, being just to people, uh, uh, availing uh, enough uh, uh, freedoms to people, to an obsession with how to sustain the new government in power, the new people in power. And uh, this uh, went on to a stage where uh, the government started to feel that it cannot rule using the same conventional state structures. As, uh, first, is this, uh, the government started by, by appointing uh, personnel which is con was considered loyal to the new government. This did not work. Then this uh, caused a shift to setting up parallel government structures. Of course, that is not ours. Let's go for ours, a much more loyal government structure. So this has created a dual uh, system of uh, uh, uh, uh, st dual structures of, of, of stating. The conventional state structures, both civil and military, and parallel civil, civilian and military structures at the same time, using the same resources available for the government. No new resources were created. So this has also led to a um, misuse and, and, and, and gross abuse of public resources. The government has gone almost bankrupt after 30 years, and it failed in the end of the day to provide the basic service to its own citizens, and, and it was rendered rather dysfunctional, and that's where an end has come to, uh, into, into, into place for uh, uh, 30 years of government that, that way. Uh, so, yeah, and this is, this is quite a big chapter to, uh, um, to, uh, to debate. Um, um, so I don't think we have enough time to. This is, this is how I see it anyway. I wish, I wish I shared this and I get it as a widely shared conception about how things and where things went wrong in our own experience in government in Sudan. So this is, this is uh, uh, uh, something I, I, I can, of course, if, if we have more time to discuss, uh, we will do so. And I, I wish my paper further elaborates on this Annie, when it's published. Uh, then uh, the other, um, another question is about Hemeti uh, um, and what, what um, our friend over there called the Janjaweed. Uh, this is one, when, uh, when DC is created by, by the model, by the paradigm. Illegitimacy uh, uh, has caused um, um, uh, a paradigm shift with regard to stating. Uh, the uh, new state needed to create parallel structures to, to do business on its behalf. One structure was the uh, uh, uh, paramilitary structures. When is 
uh, the uh, uh, uh, quick, uh, it's, called, it's called, what's it called, uh, quick, uh, rapid, rapid, rapid, rapid, yeah, rapid, rapid uh, defense, the deployment, the rapid, rapid deployment force, SDF. So uh, uh, the government at some point needed actually to, uh, to have such a structure to fight on its behalf the war against the rebels because the National Army was so much uh, uh, uh, hit by um, uh, continuous fighting in, in, in, in South Sudan for so long, then in, in Darfur, then in South Kordofan, in Blue Nile, uh, that, that uh, paramilitary structure managed to become a bit of a national army. <laughs> Uh, it's a, reali a reality of the day now. We, yeah, we need actually to see how to deal with this. Uh, uh, it's, it's over there. It's over there. Uh, how can we uh, deal with it? Of course, we cannot just uh, call for dismantling it overnight. That will create more problems than bringing about solutions. Anyway, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, on the issue of uh, foreign, the foreign factor in. Uh, uh, whether during the uh, um, Islamist uh, uh, time in government or um, after the, uh, the change that has taken place uh, lately, uh, I think um, a weakened Sudan has always made it uh, quite tempting for regional and foreign powers to, uh, uh, to, to intervene in its uh, domestic uh, uh, sphere. That has been uh, the case before uh, uh, the Islamist government rule, uh, during the Islamist rule, and uh, um, during the change and after the change that has taken place uh, earlier this year. So uh, there is such a strong foreign element. We cannot uh, fight this uh, foreign intervention back without having a strategy uh, uh, for strengthening the Sudanese, the, the capacity of Sudanese people to, uh, uh, uh, to, to deal with the, our Sudanese issues. Without this, without uh, strengthening our own capacity uh, to determine how Sudan is, is, is, is, is to do and how it, it becomes like. Without this, we remain uh, very much attractive for foreign uh, uh, powers to, to intervene in our own domestic affairs. I think uh, um, that's okay for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatima. And I will start with your, <coughs> your comment on the love-hate relationship between the military and the civilians or the political elites in the country. Um, yes, they love them, and they immediately, when they come in, they hate them. They start trying to find a way how to get rid of them or to join them. Um, many of the times when they fail to beat them, they just join them. This is why I said during especially the Numeri time and al-Bashir time, many transformations within the government itself, the military government, have taken place whereby all the political parties participated in active elections or active uh, administrative or executive roles within the government because Numeri uh, continued to be by himself, uh, plus one or two of his colleagues, those who were part of the military council who took over the power in 1996. Uh, and al-Bashir also <coughs> continued to be by himself, plus one person who was uh, uh, with him all, all, all along. But the rest of the military council were uh, dis uh, disappeared, and the civilians came, came in in different uh, phases after the CPA or the Comp Comprehensive Peace Agreement with the South, all political parties, left, center, right, joined the government and joined the parliament and became part of and um, parcels of the Council of Ministers and all other uh, apparatus of the governance of, of the country. Even the last uh, revolution, uh, where do people went to have the sitting? They went to the headquarter of the military. Ask them, please, come and intervene and let us get rid of the existing uh, military uh, government. Many questions about uh, 
Yes, uh, maybe the, the, the, the political elites who ask the military to come in, but the military enjoys, uh, enjoys being on, on, on top of power. And when they are on top of power, they, they, they, they, they definitely take care of themselves more than other institutions. This is why the military become much stronger, more expensive, and even more developed compared to the other sectors of the society. Uh, Sudan, yes, how we have a, a hard uh, economic, or hard, hard, hard hardship, economic hardship, but if you go to the military and see the industry developed by the military, military and civilian industries controlled by the military is so advanced. Uh, in a country like Sudan, yes, they, they, they are producing tanks, they are producing heavy artilleries, missiles, even drones and, and, and, and training uh, aircrafts, military training aircrafts are all produced in the country. So many hundreds of industries developed by the military. I remember vividly, even during the oil, uh, oil money in the country, the, the military budget used to go sometimes beyond all imaginations for, of the economists um, uh, because they are always uh, magnifying the threats, uh, the security threats around, around, around, around the country. And as, uh, I just want to add something to the, the paratroopers. Uh, the military, the organized military or the professional military is just too heavy to fight a guerrilla warfare. This is why they needed paratroopers to use the same means, the same tactics of the, uh, of the rebels. Um, this is why they were able to to suppress the rebellion, especially in Darfur and in other parts of the country. Um, um, Dr. Sami, um, the military, I don't think it is only the military that who, who needed to, to, to, to, to, to uh, review their stance on issues. Um, it, is not, it is not a first time business between the military and the elites. It has always been there. Uh, the elites are always there. Uh, in the case of the Islamic, uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic movement or the last uh, military government of uh, General Bashir, uh, the, the, the elites were, were, uh, were always there. And during Nimeri also different factions of the political uh, forces or the political uh, society of the country, they were always there aiding him, prolonging uh, the time of his government, um, helping to create the, transform the needed transformations every now and then so that the continuation can, uh, can, can, can uh, still maintain. Um, yeah, I think I answered this question that, that the military would love to stay in power for their own sake. Uh, they, they become well entrenched. Uh, especially their uh, their immediate needs as as as a military and as a security grantor uh, in the country, uh, who would who would win uh, the existing uh, uh, transformation or transition we are having in the country? Uh, it is a it is rather a difficult question. Uh, the coalition who led the revolution was hastily composed. It's an alliance of so many different uh, factions, more than 170 uh, groups, political parties, NGOs, and what have you. Um, they had a declaration. The uh, revolution started December 19th, officially, uh, the demonstrations against the government, and, these, and this group, who are claiming to have the power now, the political uh, or the uh, civilian behind the, the change, um, uh, formed themselves in January of this year. A very loose kind of uh, alliance, very loose kind of coalition, and already start differing on what to do. Um, one of you mentioned the Communist Party being a very strong political party. Yes, they are no longer strong, but they are there. And they are very effective, and they were very effective in organizing the uprising against, against the government, and now they are, uh, they are having the upper hand in the civilian formation uh, of the government. Other 
heavy traditional political parties who were party to the revolution are not getting their chance and they already start complaining and they are already start calling for an early uh, elections. And I think if the early elections would take place, the old traditional parties, including the Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, or the Congress party, which formed itself from the, uh, transferred itself from the, from the uh, Islamic uh, or National Islamic Front, I think they will get the lion's share if any elections taking place. But now the smaller parties, active, organized, and vocal, are taking the lead in the, in the transitional civilian uh, government. But uh, the call is, is, is, is, is mounting now for, for, for an early elections uh, in the Sudan, whereby which even those who are not party to the government, to the civilian government now will, be, will have the chance to run for election uh, next time. It is set to be three years and three months, but as I said, there is a lot of calls now, including Sadiq al Mahdi and others, calling for an early uh, elections. Uh, foreign interventions might not li like uh, early uh, in, uh, uh, elections, and also might not like a civilian, uh, a respected civilian government to, con to continue. We diplomats, we don't name names. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ali Abu yeah. Zaku. We yeah. have very I have few uh, one extra note because I was in Sudan uh, during the uh, attack uh, of uh, Gaddafi's airplanes uh, against Amdurman because of us. The National Front for the Salvation of Libya was in Khartoum. And uh, Gaddafi even offered $300 million for uh, Numeri to deliver the people of the National Front back to him. And Numeri refused. And because of that, he hit uh, Amdurman thinking that our uh, broadcasts were coming from Omdurman uh, broadcast. Uh, because of that, Gaddafi played a very destructive role because he supported Garang, the SBLA, with all the ammunition and all the weapons that he wanted in 1983. And that is what made his movement uh, successful in that time. This is one point. As for the question of uh, Dr. Sami about the other military attempt to overtake Libya, which were run by uh, the former uh, colonel, uh, the renegade Khalifa Haftar, if it were for him alone, it would have been over a long time ago. But because of the interference of the axis of evil, as Marzuki told, I mean, uh, described, the uh, Emirates, Saudis, and Egyptian axis of trying to control Libya by supporting Haftar with all the weapons and all the military and political support, adding to it France itself, that created uh, a difficult situation for the Libyan civilian forces, and especially the government uh, in Tripoli, which uh, he attacked on April 4th, lately, when the Secretary General of the United Nations was in Tripoli just to show his, his disrespect for all the United Nations. Uh, Haftar attacked the Tripoli area against the government which is now recognized by all the world at large, the government in Tripoli, the GNA. The question is really, it's a struggle between the government which the Libyans would aspire for, a civilian government, and the militarization of the country. The struggle is there between having another uh, clone Gaddafi in the name of Haftar, or having a country run by civilian people who can elect uh, or direct their affairs. This is, in short, the situation. Uh, fortunately, uh, there are some countries that really have come to our support, including Turkey. Uh, otherwise, uh, Haftar would, with the excess of evil support, could have been taken in Tripoli and could have massacred so many people. I, am, I came from Benghazi, which has been destroyed by Haftar, uh, my wife is from Derna. Another city has been destroyed by Haftar. Whoever was against his rule have no place in the society. Either they were killed or they were forced to leave the country or fight against him. And we are taking the, uh, the charge from the parliament side against him. And uh, I think 
That's enough for uh, the... By the way, he is helping himself with a lot of uh, mercenaries, including from Sudan, from Chad, and even now from Russia. The Wagner company in Russia, which is like uh, the black... Uh, what do they call it? Uh, the American ones? The black water. It's another uh, similar to it, uh, done by the Russians, and they are fighting with him. So that's the reality of the situation. Thank you. Okay, sorry for, for coming back again, but uh, two points. One is on uh, uh, the current situation in Sudan and uh, whether the, uh, there are such uh, chances for the new uh, uh, transitional government to, uh, uh, to, to, to manage to successfully uh, um, uh, um, uh, do the business uh, the transitional government is required to, to do. I think... Uh, when um, well, we, may all, may, we may need to agree that the change that has taken place in, uh, in April uh, 2019 uh, was, was something that Sudan needed, uh, needed most. That's, that, that's because uh, the uh, um, Nkaz government uh, was, was rendered a complete dysfunctional uh, government. And uh, uh, there was just no, no way for the ones who were calling for a reform uh, to, uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, manage to reform that uh, rodent um, government. Um, um, now, with the, with the change already uh, has taken place, I think um, we, we remain uh, facing um, quite some serious challenges. One, one important challenge is how to uh, arrive at some kind of a consensus by uh, Sudanese from, from different backgrounds uh, on a kind of a national project for the country that uh, uh, would uh, uh, take the country through the transitional period uh, to the um, uh, other bank of the river successfully. The other thing is how uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, would the... Uh, uh, civilian-led government arrive at some kind of a working partnership with the, with the military component, because without this, uh, the, the entire state of transition might end up into a new, a new failure, and the Sudanese might end up also with a new state of disillusion, disillusionment. So, uh, uh, of course, there is a strong uh, foreign, foreign factor. We need to do away with this uh, uh, uh, tendency to uh, by foreign, uh, both regional and international forces, uh, to shape the kind, the uh, the future of Sudan the way they like to see it uh, taking place. This also needs some uh, homework by the Sudanese, without which, of course, foreign powers might manage to uh, to to get it all done their own way. Uh, on the issue of uh, um, the Islamists coming to power in 1989 by. By, by, by force, by military force. I think there was also a kind of a miscalculation by the leadership of the Islamists by then. And I think the late Hassan al-Turabi, and he was such a great man, but he committed a serious mistake. That was due to the state of um, self-overconfidence of Hassan al-Turabi himself. He thought, due to that overconfidence, that he can uh, get things done the way he was planning for them to take place. And that the, the guys, um, his sons in the military, with whom he called in to, uh, to execute the, uh, the coup, would have just followed the book. But that uh, uh, turned out to be not, not the case. And the story went on. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers for their excellent presentation. Applause for them, please. Thank you, Dr. Fatima Abdullah. Uh, thanks for our speakers, and thank you for your uh, question and comment. Now I am asking Dr. Sami, please, to come to give the appreciation uh, momentous to our speakers. Uh, Dr. Ali Abu Zakouk. Okay. Dr. Fatima, first of all. Yes.
دكتور الصادق الفقيه عن دكتور محمد محشوب عن دكتور فاطمة Our next session it will be on Turkey, and we will uh, continue at uh, 11:50 after the break. Moderator should be attend ah, in the end. Okay. Were you able to copy the, uh, yeah, the thing? Yeah, I'm copying it. Okay. No, this is mine. This is not yours. No, mine says Omar Aslan. So if you put Z, you know Z, and this one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, you're the second one. Okay. So okay. Yeah, can I take yeah, this? Yeah, you can take it. Okay. Can we do the... Yeah. <laughs> there are so many things in it. So you can also like do it by pressing Washington shift. Body. Oh, okay, anyway, let me just do this. Alright, why does it say... Why does it say that? No. Should I... Eject it. Yeah? Yeah, from that. So I just uh, go and open it from yeah, here. Yeah, you have so to open it, and open. they will connect it from there. Oh, okay. okay. Automatic. Okay. Best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Korkmaktı başım şu oturduğunuzdan da yapabilirsiniz. Oradan şey yapıyorlar komandayı. Oradan şey yapabiliyor muyuz? Onlar şey yapacaklar. Ben ne istediğim zaman. Ha, oradan da yapabilirler, buradan da yapabilirsiniz. Ben, İsterseniz ben, ben komandayı getireyim size. Ben, ben, ben, ha, buradan da olur. Eğer, eğer burada yaparsanız sunumu buradan daha rahat hocam. İngilizlerden Deneme. Deneme, deneme, deneme. Deneme. Deneme, deneme. Deneme. Deneme, deneme. Sağlık o kesiyoruz. 